Hello and welcome to this tutorial on the basics of relational frame theory, focusing on the steps of learning language and cognition from an RFT perspective. So this tutorial is adapted from the second part of chapter one in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. You can find other resources on the clinical applications of RFT at languageasintervention.com. In this tutorial, you will learn the basic principles of RFT, the principles of intrinsic and symbolic relating and deriving, transformation of function, and rules. So, in the previous tutorial, we saw that RFT approaches language as the learned behavior of building and responding to symbolic relations. In this tutorial, we're going to unpack this definition a bit so that we can see how more basic RFT principles are involved in language. If you remember what we said in the previous tutorial, RFT is part of contextual behavioral science and functional contextualism, which means that in RFT, we approach behaviors in functional relation to the context. So let's see how we can approach the behavior of relating in functional relation to the context. RFT has produced a number of experiments to study the behavior of relating and how the context influences it. Instead of going through a whole experiment, I'm just going to give you a natural example that reflects what RFT does in its experiments. You can see this typical educative toy for kids, where the goal is to put objects in holes according to their shapes. As the kid is playing, maybe there is a parent nearby who helps him and comments what is happening. For example, the parent may say, pick the same, while showing the hole with a triangle shape. If the kid picks a triangle, the parent says, good job. If the kid picks a square, the parent says, no, it's not the same. So progressively, as the kid learns to match the objects and the holes in presence of cues like pick the same, as with the blue circle here, he learns what this cue means. This is what we call a contextual cue. So the child learns to relate objects and holes under the influence of the context. Progressively, as we go through multiple learning experiences like this, we learn to respond according to an increasing number of contextual cues. There are many kinds of contextual cues. For example, when we relate this cat to this dog, we can say that the cat is smaller, according to the size, the same, according to the color, or different, according to the shape. Note that at this point, relations are built according to intrinsic characteristics of stimuli. It means that even if we didn't make these relations, the cat and the dog would still have the same color, but a different shape and size. If there was no human on this planet to talk about the characteristics of the dog and the cat, they would still share similarities and differences along these dimensions. So the only difference would be that there wouldn't be any language to make these relations. So when we relate things based on intrinsic characteristics, we can call that intrinsic relating. But what happens next is amazing and, and really crucial to understand what is so specific about language. Contextual cues can be applied regardless of the intrinsic characteristics of the stimuli. What it means is that I can say, for example, that this dress is like this black dress. So it might seem weird, but that's because they are both morning dresses. So even though they are quite different at an intrinsic level, they are similar at the symbolic level. And I can say that this white dress is different than this other white dress because this second white dress is a wedding dress. So while they actually have more in common than the black dress and the white morning dress earlier, these two white dresses are different at a symbolic level. Once again here, the, context, the contextual cue is applied independently of the intrinsic characteristics. So when relating is done independently of the intrinsic characteristics of the things being related, we can call that symbolic relating. And actually, this is where the metaphor of the frame comes from and why we call language framing in RFT. A contextual cue can be applied to anything like a frame can contain any kind of picture. There is no need to consider intrinsic characteristics to establish a relation between two or several things. So we will often use the term framing as a synonym for relating during this course. 
One amazing thing about language is that we can produce and understand relations that we have never been directly taught. This is what we often call the generativity of language. From an RFT perspective, it happens through the process of derivation. So let me show you how this works. Let's use two pictures that don't share a particular relation at this point. And if we use the context QLQ is like, you can now respond to the red cross the same way you respond to the blue triangle. If we also tell you that this green square is like the blue triangle, you will be able to respond to the green square the same way as to the blue triangle. You learn these two relations through direct training. But what we observe then is that with no additional training, you are able to derive the relations that go in the reverse direction. This is what we call mutual entailment. So this might seem obvious to you, but if we take a minute to think about it, it is quite extraordinary to know something that we have never been taught before. And look, it gets even more remarkable. You can derive that the red cross and the green square are similar even though they have never been presented together. This is what we call combinatorial entailment. So what we learned so far is how language can be approached through what we call in RFT, arbitrarily applicable derived relational responding. You understand now that derived relational responding means, that, means the behavior of building relations which includes deriving relations that have not been taught before. And arbitrarily applicable means that it can be symbolic or that it doesn't depend on intrinsic characteristics of the things being related. So this is how we arrive to the metaphor of relational networks for thinking and talking. As we saw before, in a therapy interaction, both the clients and the therapist think and talk, so they produce relational networks all the time. And these networks interact with each other, leading to some influence. To help you visualize interactions in the therapy room as relational networks, here's a simple example of what a therapist and a client can tell each other and how we can visualize it as networks. When the therapist asks, what is it, li what is it like for you when you feel anxious? He's building relations among words and images that form sentences. And as the client answers, when I feel anxious, it's like electric shocks everywhere in my body. You can see again how words and images form a network. Okay, so we saw that uh, with language, we build and derive relations. This point covers a part of our definition of language. Another main part is the influence that language exerts on our behaviors, what we call responding to symbolic relations in our definition. This influence comes from the ability of language to transform the meaning of the things we relate. In RFT, we say that building relations can transform the function of the things we relate, like a battery connected to a bulb change the impact of the bulb. It can produce light now. So with language, we don't only describe things, we can change their impacts, their effects, their meaning, or what we call in RFT, their function. There are plenty of RFT experiments that show how relating changing functions. For example, if I tell you that uh, when the blue triangle will appear on the screen, you will receive an electric shock, but that you can avoid it by pressing a button, you will probably press the button when the blue triangle appears. And because you derive relations, and you learned earlier that the red cross and the green square are the same as the blue triangle, you will probably press the button when you see these pictures too. Relating has changed the function of these pictures. They now warn you that a danger is coming. Here is an example of transformation in therapy. A client might see drinking as something that makes him feel better. In his network, drinking alcohol and feeling better are in a conditional relation. One leads to the other. And so drinking is seen as something positive here. But if the therapist asks the client about the long-term effect of drinking alcohol, it might transform the function of drinking. Now drinking is something that damages the client's health, for example. The therapist used his language 
to influence the way the client responds to drinking alcohol. Transformation leads to influence, and so it means that language is a behavior that influences behaviors. From an RFT perspective, this can happen in two main ways. First, symbolic antecedents and consequences can influence our behaviors the same way intrinsic antecedents and consequences do, except that we don't need a history of direct contact with these elements of the context. A consequence can be purely symbolic, like money, for example. There is no, nothing intrinsically attractive about a bill of $100, but the equivalence it shares with stuff we can buy with it makes it quite attractive. And language can influence our behaviors also because relations can combine to form rules and instructions that specify a behavior and its antecedents and consequences. This way, we can engage in behaviors even if we have never been exposed to its antecedents and consequences. For example, in most cultures, laws are defined to regulate the way people interact with each other. People thus end up avoiding doing certain things like stealing money from other people even if they may never have experienced the bad consequence of stealing money from other people. Of course, people don't necessarily follow the same rules. Some people might actually follow a rule specifying that stealing is a good thing. We will come back to this point later. So let's see briefly how rules and instructions work from an RFT perspective. I will simplify a little bit an RFT experiment on instructional control. Imagine you have a keyboard with stickers on the keys like this, and you learn the meaning of a contextual cue such that you know it means after. If you then see on the screen of the computer this series of pictures and contextual cues, you should be able to know what to do. First, you press the yellow square, then the green triangle, and finally the blue circle. As you can see, contextual cues can tell you what to do. As we will see in our next tutorial, in psychopathology, the influence of language over our behaviors is pervasive. If we take an example of a person with suicidal thoughts who thinks, I can't keep living this way, I would be better off dead, we could analyze each element of these sentences through relations and contextual cues. The main relation is probably that being dead is better than feeling depressed. It transforms the function of death, which is now something attractive. As a result, this person might be encouraged to kill herself. The last point I want to talk about today is rule following. We just said that rules can influence our behaviors, but there are different ways we can follow rules. In fact, it depends on what reinforces rule following. One way is called tracking, which is when following a rule is reinforced by contacting the consequences specified by this rule. In simpler terms, it means that we follow a rule because we contact the consequence described by the rule. For example, if you follow the instructions of a recipe to make a delicious chocolate cake, and you end up actually making a delicious cake and enjoy it, you will likely follow these instructions again in the future. So tracking is following rules while still being well in touch with our experience. We follow the rules, but only if it helps reach the consequences promised by the rules. Another way of following rules is called pliance, which is um, when following a rule is socially reinforced because of the consistency between the action specified by the rule and the performed action. In simpler terms, it means that we follow a rule because doing so is socially reinforced, regardless of the correspondence between what the rule says and our experience. So it doesn't matter if the rule gives a, a good or bad advice, what matters is to follow the rule, period. For example, some people tend to follow recipes regardless of the consequences because they trust the recipe makers 100%. Even when they see something weird in the proportions, for example, they still follow the rule because they assume that following the instructions is what they are supposed to do when using a recipe. Often, it leads people to make dishes that are not very good. It might have been easy to change the recipe, but for them, what was reinforcing was to follow the recipe as it was written in the book.
So we will talk more in the next tutorial about the implication of these different forms of rule following in psychopathology. But just as a teaser for this next tutorial, what we can say is that pliance will tend to induce more persistence in behaviors that are not effective. If we follow rules regardless of their utility, we can easily end up doing things that are not working, and we keep doing these things even though it's not working. Persistence of ineffective behaviors is clearly one of the main features of psychological problems. So here is a summary of the main points you've learned in this tutorial and that I encourage you to remember. We learn to relate things under the influence of contextual cues. These contextual cues can be applied according to intrinsic characteristics, like when we say that a black cat and a black dog are similar based on their color. That's what we call intrinsic relating. We can also apply these contextual cues regardless of the intrinsic characteristics, like when we say that a white morning dress is the same as a black morning dress. That's what we call symbolic relating. Relating leads to the transformation of functions of the things being related, and uh, it can in turn influence the way we respond to these things. For example, if I show you a chocolate cake and I say, it's good, I will probably increase the chance that you will eat it, whereas if I say it is bad, you will be less likely to eat it. Influence of language over her behaviors happens through symbolic antecedents and consequences and through rules. There are different ways of following rules, tracking and pliance. In tracking, we follow rule because doing so is reinforced by the consequence described by the rule. In pliance, we follow rule because doing so is socially reinforced, regardless of the correspondence between what the rule says and our experience. Pliance makes it more likely that we persist in behaviors that are not working. So this is the end of this tutorial on the basics of relational frame theory, focusing on the steps of learning language and cognition. This tutorial was adapted from the second part of chapter one in Mastering the Clinical Conversation, Language as Intervention. If you want to watch the next tutorial on language and psychopathology with problems linked to a lack of fluency and flexibility in relational framing, experiential avoidance, and persistence, you can go to languageasintervention.com. You will also find other resources on the applications of RFT for clinical practice.